If you've been in city centre lately, you might have seen one of the Go Vegan campaign posters outside your favourite shops or even at your bus stop. Signs that say things like, eggs, what price does he pay? But there are even stronger messages. Thought-provoking adverts are going to be appearing on uh, Birmingham taxis, mm-hmm. uh, on the Warsaw Digital Billboard and the M6, uh, on video screens at New Street. Well, John Corner's on the line. He's president of the Irish Creamier Milk Suppliers Association. John, what do you make of these ads, these posters and the message that they're portraying? Hi, it's Emily from Bite Size Vegan, and welcome to another vegan nugget. There's no shortage of animals in advertising, with many species mascots hawking all manner of products, up to and including their own flesh and secretions. Catering perfectly to the inherent dichotomy of animal lovers who eat animals, meat, dairy, and egg industry ads are rife with smiling animals all too happy to be eaten, or comically encouraging the consumption of others. This rather perverse yet extremely pervasive concept is something I explored in depth in this video, Do Animals Want to Be Eaten? But what if the animals we eat actually ran their own ad campaign and replaced the billboards emblazoned with their severed body parts and secretions with distinct individuals? What would they say to us? What would they ask of us? And how would it change our behavior and attitudes towards them? This is the very premise of Go Vegan World, the largest and longest running vegan public advertising campaign spanning several countries and reaching millions upon millions of people. At the heart of this incredibly effective international endeavor is Sandra Higgins, a vegan psychologist, educator, activist, and the founder and director of Eden Farmed Animal Sanctuary, the first of its kind in Ireland. In addition to caring for Eden's 120 or so residents, Sandra delivers speeches all over the world and provides vegan mentorship and classes through Matilda's Promise, a vegan education center named after one of Eden's first residents. Please see the blog post for this video linked in the description below to learn more about Matilda's story. Without further ado, let's hear from Sandra herself about the genesis of Go Vegan World from the roots of Eden. I realized that, you know, for every for every individual who lives at Eden, this is the most important thing that we can offer them a home. But in terms of the changes that we need in the world, in the way that we relate to other species, other animals, that's not enough. We need vegan education. So Go Vegan World really was born out of a period of darkness for me. I was running the Vegan Education Centre and I was doing individual vegan mentoring, but most of the people attending me were actually attending me online from outside Ireland. And the speaking invitations I was getting were coming from outside Ireland. So, I, you know, I was in a, this dark place that many activists will be familiar with, lying awake at night, feeling frustrated, seeing the results at the cold face of animal activism, seeing the victims come in here and feeling stymied and feeling like my mouth had been zipped shut and there was nothing I could do to get that message out to the world. The idea was inspired by people who had run bus advertising in in the United States and in Canada and I decided to do that here in Ireland. So I did that for about four months and it was extremely successful. And it was so successful that we decided to make it an international campaign. And the strength of Go Vegan World is that the animals, for the first time ever, are on the streets. Real individuals, many of them who live at Eden, live and died. I mean, some of them have died while the campaign is on the street. For instance, we had Diana was in the first campaign. They trust us, we betray them. And then some of her photographs were in, were in the second campaign. And as the campaign progressed, I got a phone call to say that she had gone blind and, you know, within four weeks she she had died. So they they, they live and die here and the very least we can do is, is let them tell their own stories. We used to think in the beginning here at Eden that we were rescuing them. No, they are rescuing us from our ignorance and I'm still ignorant. Every single day I learn something new about them. And, and about what we're doing to them. And that's the strength of what's coming from Eden, and that's why I feel that the work I do here is not mine, it's their work. Some of the very strong ways in which Eden and the residents at Eden have influenced the Go Vegan World campaign are some of those last ads that I used, like vegetarianism is not enough for all the animals used for clothing in research, for animals used for eggs, for the mammals used in the dairy industry. Whenever anybody comes to Eden and they talk about cutting down on animal use and eating less meat is nearly always the one that they come up with. 
I introduced them, say, to one of the enclosures at Eden here where we have Emily, George and Charlotte. And I asked them, you know, if you're going to eat less, can you tell me which of them you'll spare and which of them you'll kill? And the message gets home very quickly that eating less meat is no use to the one who's killed. This incredibly simple yet profoundly powerful approach of focusing on the animal's individuality and personhood is the key to Go Vegan World's effectiveness, especially within the heart of Ireland's agricultural areas. I asked Sandra whether the cultural location of the ads affected their composition, if she'd had any difficulty securing space, and what the public reception has been so far. It hasn't affected how I've constructed the ads at all because the ads tell the truth about animal use and what the animals need from us. So they stay the same regardless of where I show the ads. The international campaign is running in the centre of, 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 of some of the largest cities in the world. London, Birmingham, the, Glasgow, the three largest cities in, in the United Kingdom. How they're received is very different though. In the UK, people have been very, very receptive. So in a two week period, following the largest campaign that we've run in Birmingham, 36,000 people expressed an interest in downloading the, the vegan guide. The public are not insulted They're, by what you're telling them. They're anxious to know. And the words that rang in my ears all the time in the UK were, I never knew this. The Birmingham Mail actually ran a poll asking people about the effect that the campaign had on them. I think it was 63% of people said they would go vegan, having seen the campaign, and another 10% said that they would consider going vegan. Also, the advertising world itself has taken an interest in the campaign. So the, the campaign won an award for the bathroom advertising, not the most attractive advertising, but because of such a dwell time, um, it's really effective. So it, it, in that campaign, I tried to dispel the myth of humane use, particularly in the egg and dairy industry, and the notion that animal foods are necessary for human health. Marketing Week ran something on us last month, the subject of disruptive advertising. So in the same paragraph as Sony and Facebook and the Financial Times, they included Go Vegan World advertising. The whole campaign is designed to get people to go to the website so that they get accurate information about animal use and a clear and consistent call to stop using other animals completely and, and now and to make it easy for them to do that. And one of the most effective tools of the campaign is the vegan guide. So people can download that either by seeing the ads on the street or through social media or through the online advertising campaign that I run that targets non-vegans. Or they can use the Q code that's on some of the ads that are at eye level on the street, or they can use a free text number. In Ireland, uh, people were a lot more defensive and of course, you know, in agricultural areas, this is very entrenched in the Irish psyche. The, the relationship with the land and the belief that other animals are our property, the belief actually that it forms um, some kind of economic security in the country, which it actually doesn't. But people felt very threatened. They felt that I was threatening their, their, their way of earning a living and, and their very lifestyles. In terms of securing ad space, yeah, there was a lot more difficulty in Ireland than there has been outside Ireland. So the campaign almost didn't happen in Ireland at all. I've also had difficulty in the UK. I've had difficulty on television, but I haven't had difficulty with the outdoor advertising. It's the first time a vegan ad has ever made it to television. It's been viewed by a lot of people. We've seen an increase in the number of vegan guide downloads. Very interestingly, there have been no complaints. There have been complaints in the UK about the street ads, but there have been no complaints about the television ad. As Sandra said, animal agriculture is deeply rooted within Ireland's culture, economy, and national identity. This was one of the most challenging aspects for me as an outsider attempting to speak about veganism in Ireland, and it was my research for that speech that led me to Sandra's work in the first place. I reached out to her for her insight and expertise and had the distinct honor of sharing the stories of Eden residents Joy and Alice in my speech in Dublin. Months later, while walking the grounds of Eden, Sandra told me a story that gave me goosebumps. 
and hope for change. One of the most remarkable examples was the farmer who gave us two of the pigs who are here, Emily and, and Charlotte. He, he gave us Grace as well and, and Grace died very, very young. I was just going to bed one night at about 10 or half 10 and there was a knock on the door and it was the farmer who had given us the pigs and he came back to ask me how we ever started to do this to other animals. And, and he was very interested and he came again a few weeks ago and he said the more he talks to us and the more he sees what we do here, the more convinced he is that uh, farming is wrong and that veganism is, is right. Of course, when you see the inside of farms and when you see the condition of the bodies that I rescue and what they go through and the deaths they have, of course, it's very easy to blame farmers. And when we think about the dreadful things they do in the dairy industry, in the egg industry, in the mutilations and everything, of course, it's, it's easy to look at them and say they're heartless. But they're doing what their fathers did. They're doing what this country tells them to do, what it encourages them to do, what it pays them to do. They're doing what we pay them to do every time we go into a shop and make a non-vegan purchase. They're doing what the schools are teaching them to do, but they're not the only problem. And it is very heartening when farmers come to Eden and are open to what we're doing here, just open enough to listen, that there might be an alternative way. And it's one of the strengths of Go Vegan World is that we've tried, and, and to a certain extent we've succeeded, in building positive relationship with farmers so that they see plant-based agriculture as an alternative to their current life and that they understand that veganism is not the enemy of farmers. We'll always need farmers. And veganism is very much the friend of farmers. The residents of Eden have not only changed the hearts of farmers and launched an international ad campaign, but they were also the impetus for Sandra's own vegan conversion. All my work is inspired and informed by the animals at Eden. I learned about sentience at their hands. So I'm not one of the people who, had, who at that stage read animal rights theory. I didn't know anything about it. The word vegan wasn't on my radar. I learned about sentience from them just by observing them. They made me question. I started to think about it. I fell into the humane myth thing for a few months. I was vegetarian myself, but I was still cooking meat for other people. Um, we were still using eggs and dairy products. And then one night, some goats arrived in our yard and they belonged to one of the dairies close by us. So I visited that dairy when we gave the goats back and I walked out vegan. And I spent the next week researching animal rights and I found the film Earthlings. And when I watched Earthlings, I threw out every animal product in the house. I went vegan overnight. You know, the food wasn't great for the first fortnight. I didn't know what I was doing. I was, I was worried about my health because I have severe, very severe osteoporosis. And I have to say that it was easy. It was easy and I've never looked back and it completely changed my life. I hope that you've enjoyed hearing from Sandra and, through her, the many survivors who have lived and died at Eden. Though she will always defer to them, and rightly so, I am constantly amazed by not only the astounding scope of Sandra's activism, but also her dedication to preserving the integrity of their message. If you want to help support this vital work, Eden is in need of volunteers and currently has some job vacancies as well. Please see the blog post linked in the description for how to apply. You can also share the Go Vegan World campaign to further the reach of their stories. My deepest thanks to Sandra for sparing time from her certainly packed schedule to be on the channel. Give this video a like and be sure to share it far and wide, and subscribe to the channel and click the bell to enable notifications of new videos. If you want to help support messages like this, see the support links below or join us in the Nugget Army on Patreon via the link in the sidebar. Now go live vegan, world, and I'll see you soon. Oh, yes! Pig in the camera. <laughs> Good girl. That is a happy pig. <laughs>